So the uh, Qing Dynasty, uh, 1644 to 1911 CE. You don't need to write the Chinese. <laughs> Uh, right, so 1611, uh, 1644 to 1911. Um, they were the last imperial dynasty to rule imperial China. The dynasty attained its height during the uh, reign of the Qianlong Emperor, who ruled between 1735 to 1796. CE. The Qing um, emperors were ethnically Manchus, a semi-nomadic people originating from Northeast Asia, which would be uh, above, uh, right about here, above uh, Korea. In 1644, the Manchus invaded China and conquered the Ming Dynasty, uh, which was 1368 to 1644 CE. Ming as in right, uh, which means, or as if you are a Chinese language learner, you might know a Ming Tian, which means uh, tomorrow. Uh, Ming is comprised of two characters, uh, Ru and Ye, uh, Yue. Uh, Ru means uh, sun, Yue means uh, moon, so if you put them together, it means bright. Um, the Qing founded a multi ethnic empire that included uh, China, Manchuria, Taiwan, Tibet, as well as large parts of Central Asia. They grew to be considerably larger than the previous Ming Dynasty, and the Manchus were direct descendants of the Jurchens, who ruled northern China as the Jin Dynasty between 1115 to 1234 CE, um, and were defeated by the Mongols. Any questions thus far? Yes. Sure. Um, any questions thus far about the introduction? So in the 19th century, it seemed that little was more stereotypically Chinese than opium addiction. It was thought to be an almost universal uh, condition amongst the Chinese, a misrepresentation that made China both exotic and dangerous. Down through time, foreign observers have been surprised and perhaps disappointed that opium dens in China were decidedly unden-like. They were bright and clean, the clientele looked and acted respectively far from the stereotypical, hopeless opium fiends of the popular imagination. By the turn of the 20th century, when China was ruled by the Qing Dynasty, as much as 15% of China's population used opium. That would be about 60 million people. And it was not just men who indulged, uh, from empresses and imperial consorts down to the poor, uh, poorest common woman. Opium was central to the lives of and work of prostitutes and courtesans. Amongst uh, female factory workers and food stall operators, opium smoking was a legitimate social pastime. The original source for most of this opium was India. Once uh, 18th century British colonial authorities discovered that high quality potent patna opium and cheap mawa opium were popular in China, they promoted poppy cultivation and opium production. Meanwhile, social and economic uh, trends within China itself created a large and growing market for the drug. For all of opium's allure and some significant medical benefits, it can be highly addictive, and with all addictions, personal tragedy and social disruption come in addiction's wake. Consequently, amongst uh, China's 60 million users, there must have been hundreds of thousands of addicts at any one time. Addiction ensnared the poorest laborer and the most senior imperial official. Some addicts were estranged from their families and became part of a floating underclass that unnerved imperial officials. However, many users were uh, used exquisite cloisonné pipes with uh, silver filigree 
and had very expensive sets of smoking utensils of the finest craftsmanship, uh, showing an example of high culture. The uh, prevailing or most widely accepted view is well summarized by H.H. H. Kane, an American doctor and author of the book, Opium Smoking in America and China. He wrote, Opium is bound to sink morality, the fertile cause of crime, lying, insanity, death, and suicide. A poison to hope and ambition, a slander of family ties, a breeder of sensuality, and finally, impotence. The image of the opium addict was not the elite moderate user, but rather the lost soul in the depths of addiction, a doomed wretch who had given up on everything. But opium abuse was as much a problem in 19th century Britain and the United States as it was in China. Even as the uh, threat of opium was being conflated with the xenophobic fear of Chinese immigration or the so-called yellow peril, some Westerners reveled in the exotic pleasure of smoking opium in high-end salons in Chinatowns, decked out in the latest oriental fashion. The phrase, century of humiliation, um, in the Chinese imagination began with the Opium War of 1839 to 1842, in which the British Empire went to war to defend its lucrative opium trade. China's defeat and the peace treaties it signed afterwards are thought to have systematically undermined China's power and sovereignty, leaving it open to foreign exploitation. Uh, this trend reached its height during the brutal Japanese occupation of China in the 1930s and 1940s. In this national narrative, the sale and use of opium, and especially its forced importation into China, are inseparable from foreign invasion and national humiliation. Today, though, a certain narcophobia inclines many of us to look at opiates as a social scourge and assume that every user is soon to be a hopeless self-destructive addict. But historically, and uh, most opium users in general, and in China specifically, were moderate and occasional users. We also need to realize that opium can be a very useful drug and not just as a painkiller. Um, it was especially useful in a world without ready access to advanced medical care. For instance, uh, penicillin, a cure for many common ailments that opium was used to mitigate, wasn't widely available in China until the 1940s. Opium is effective at treating the symptoms of pneumonia and other respiratory ailments. It is used to treat inflammation of the internal organs, malaria, typhoid, and cholera. It is used as a treatment for nervous disorders, for dysentery, colitis, and a host of other gastrointestinal ailments. In the U.S., opium was widely prescribed to women uh, suffering from labor pains and postpartum complications. So it was entirely reasonable for your average family in Imperial China to keep a small supply of opium for medical reasons. And if the educated upper class that the average person aspires to join smokes opium, it entices more people to smoke. But for those in the minority who are physiologically and psychologically prone to opium addiction, the outcome can be awful. The process of withdrawal may be even more daunting. Long-term opium use can cause the body to stop producing endorphins. Those are natural pain managers. Going without endorphins makes withdrawal excruciating. There is also insomnia, seizures, hallucinations, delusions, and paranoia. Withdrawal can exacerbate pre-existing mental conditions, such as bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and sociopathic behavior. This is where addiction reaches beyond the individual to the family and the society. Uh, so that raises the question, uh, why did Imperial China get hooked on opium? to the four major factors in a short while. Yes, would you like to? Uh, these are uh, adult-aged women, 
and then this would be a adult age man. Probably, I'll guess that this might be a uh, Yanguan, which is like a uh, a uh, formal smoke shop that I, I, would, I will go into detail later. Uh, any other questions? Um, opium originated in the Eastern Mediterranean, and we know it made its way to China in the hold of Arab ships, and was brought via camel caravan from Southwest Asia. Medical and recreational consumption of opium in China long predates the drug's massive 19th century importation. We see the earliest reference to opium date to the first and second century CE, during the Han Dynasty. This is going way back, um, so it's about 100 to 200 AD. Um, in the Tang Dynasty, that is 618 to 907, we see discussions of the medicinal merits of the drug. By the Song Dynasty, which ended in 1279, the medicinal value of the sticky residue extracted from the poppy was widely recognized. Yes. Yes. Su Shi, an iconic uh, Song Dynasty intellectual man, ingested his fair share of opium as well. So opium has a long history in Imperial China. The turning point came during the late Ming Dynasty, that is 1368 to 1644 CE. Up to that point, most opium users called poppy eaters uh, swallowed opium. But in the late 1500s, the Dutch introduced the practice of mixing opium with the new American crop, tobacco. It's a mixture called madoc, and it's uh, smoked through a pipe. Smoking straight tobacco and madoc quickly became an integral part of the elite social life in China, and smoking readily lent itself to connoisseurship and high fashion. Like fine wine or single malt scotch today, China's opium fashion took on many forms, many flavors, and many variations. Another thing to consider is that opium smoking was highly ritualized. The finer opium clubs, or yenguan, uh, would provide an expert cooker and shaper. If you were visiting a private home and you were a particularly honored guest, uh, your host would make a point of performing a ritualized preparation. The use of opium was part of the literati social class uh, culture of relaxation and good fellowship. This as we know how a proper tea time in an English manner puts much emphasis on the silverware and the tea set. Expensive and beautifully crafted opium sets were fashioned for the elite, as were highly elaborate and sophisticated ceremonies and rituals. And as opium smoking became a marker of elite status, the appeal started to migrate down the social ladder. As a result, the late Ming period marked the beginning of China's long love affair with smoking and with smoking culture. Beginning with pipe tobacco and madoc in the 16th to 18th centuries, adding to that the smoking of pure opium in the 19th century, and most definitely cigarettes in the 20th and 21st centuries. In the 16th century, the government of the Ming Dynasty started to tax uh, medicinal opium sales. This would prove to be a steady and lucrative source of revenue. The Qing Dynasty that followed the Ming had a much more schizophrenic opium policy. It alternately taxed and banned the drug and couldn't seem to figure out if it was a social scourge or a good source of revenue. In the early 19th century, some Qing officials were growing concerned about both the societal cost of opium use and the impact opium trade was having on the economy, especially on the silver supply. The huge outflow of silver from Chinese consumers to pay British suppliers for Indian opium versus what had been a trade imbalance that had been in China's favor since the 16th century. The reverse in the import-export balance was enormous. Up to the late 18th century, uh, which is around the 1780s and 1790s, 80% of the value of the Western cargoes being landed at the port of Canton or Guangzhou uh, was uh, silver bullion. The British couldn't find any products that the Chinese wanted to buy as much as the British wanted to buy Chinese silk, porcelain, and especially Chinese tea. So China had been a huge sponge for global silver uh, for 200 years. But in the early 1800s, the foreign opium trade into China reversed that silver flow, much to the benefit of the British Empire. 
and Qing officials were starting to get worried. A major dip in silver supply was a potential catalyst for economic crisis and social unrest. So what we see in the opium phenomenon of the 19th century China is the convergence of four major factors. Um, one being the pre-existing opium culture. Um, um, large sectors of which, especially in China's huge cities, had a modest amount of um, modest amount of spending money. Uh, silver in particular. Uh, third was a series of epidemics. Uh, such as cholera that brought intense pain and distress to millions of Chinese. And fourth, um, there was a cheap and potent supply of Indian opium. that started to find its way through China's sophisticated internal markets. So there was a huge demand and an excellent supply chain. Does anyone have any questions about what I wrote on the board? Okay. From the 16th to the 20th centuries, China was a cash society and opium was a pleasant diversion or essential medication readily available for those to, with the cash to pay for it. Initially, it was the elite, as we've seen, who made opium a centerpiece of their social lives. Opium use, therefore, uh, was widespread in the imperial bureaucracy. But as opium became cheaper and easier to get, it found its uh, ready market and was re rapidly adopted into the daily lives and social fabric of numerous communities. Here's how one British consular explained it. A pipe of opium is to the Chinese workman what a glass of beer is to the English laborer. Smoking was practically synonymous with being an examination candidate. Taking the civil service exams was incredibly stressful and traveling to the provincial or imperial capital to sit for the exams could be hard on the candidates physically and emotionally. And opium smoking was a common pastime for soldiers and for the boatmen and lock operators on the Grand Canal. So opium found its way through the immense Chinese economy, starting in the big coastal cities, um, and then out and down through the market. Uh, by the 1830s, opium had uh, become enough of a concern that the Qing government was forced to act. However, the imposition of domestic prohibitions made little headway. The government was particularly hard pressed when it came to opium smuggling. Opium is a compact and high value cargo. It can be easily offloaded from bigger ships onto small, uh, fleets of smaller boats, the Chinese called fast crabs or scrambling dragons. These are shallow draft galle galleys that could easily outrun uh, government ships. So the government moved further up the supply chain. Superintendent Lin Zixu was uh, posted to the port of Guangzhou uh, northwest of modern Hong Kong or Xiangang uh, in Guangdong province where Cantonese or Guangdonghua is spoken. Uh, Lin used his mandate from the emperor to force Western merchants to halt all imports of opium. Lin's methods included holding foreign merchants hostage until they signed affidavits renouncing the opium trade. He also destroyed billions of dollars worth of opium. These actions were a costless belly for Great Britain. Lin Zixu's well-intentioned war on drugs led to a real war and led to the Qing's disastrous defeat in the Opium War of 1839 to 1842. In that conflict, Qing forces were defeated at every turn by a relatively small British expeditionary force of maybe 10,000 men. The British moved unopposed and harassed ports up and down the China coast. When the Royal Navy's steam-driven gunships, including the HMS Nemesis, 
threatened the southern capital of Nanjing, the Qing had no choice but to seek terms. So the uh, 1842 Treaty of Nanjing included the uh, payment of reparations. In uh, silver, uh, increased foreign access to the China market. And the opening of three of uh, four additional ports along the Southeast China coast. The treaty included the secession of Hong Kong to Great Britain, which remained a crown colony of Britain until 1997. Does anyone have any questions about what I just wrote on the board? There was a fixed tariff and most significantly full dip diplomatic recognition of Great Britain by the Qing Emperor. That's the same as the Emperor admitting that Queen Victoria was equal. The Qing model of foreign relations had been prefaced on the idea of the superiority of its emperor to all other rulers, which is why many historians identify this military defeat in the Opium War and these specific uh, treaty terms as the beginning of the end of Imperial China. With respect to the ongoing opium trade, the opening of more ports increased and broadened British India's access to China, and Chinese demand uh, easily kept pace. In the 1870s and 1880s, opium imports peaked at over 10 million pounds a year. Its use was more pervasive than ever, but domestic production was ra rapidly catching up. Still, all aspects of opium phenomenon, from the poppy to opium distribution and consumption, were all part of late imperial culture with the society and with economics. And if we stick to the traditional historical historiography, uh, this is a sad tale about a foreign drug and the aggressive foreign powers that imported and marketed that drug, overcoming China's traditional institutions and poisoning Chinese society. The Qing dynasty was also having trouble meeting expenses. And not just war reparations to Great Britain, tax revenues were down, while at the same time the dynasty faced massive internal rebellion and the mounting cost of modernizing its civil institutions and its military. So I'd like to spend a brief time going over the uh, military and weapons used by the Qing and how it differed from the Europeans. The introduction of gunpowder weapons in Chinese, Mongolian, and Manchurian warfare reduced the effect effectiveness of their traditional weapons, primarily the uh, horse archer. Throughout the, the early 1700s, European and Chinese forces were evenly matched. However, Chinese armies used primarily traditional weapons that were still very lethal during this period. They referred to their gunpowder weapons as hot weapons, or bing qi, and their uh, Traditional weapons as cold weapons or long bing qi. Uh, the introduction of gunpowder weapons dramatically changed step warfare. The uh, horse archer no longer dominated nomadic step warfare as it had done since ancient times. However, firearms were at times restricted within the Qing military. Qing leaders would sometimes reserve guns for their Manchu units and would prevent the Han Chinese divisions from using them. Although the suppression of firearms should not be over-exaggerated, improvements in designs for guns and cannons was promoted in China during this time. Due to its traditional role in Manchu culture, many Manchu leaders preferred the bow. Manchu soldiers frequently devoted most of their training towards archery practice rather than firearms practice. Yes? Can I really my Sure. 
The Manchus were eager to preserve their nomadic origins and traditions. They continued to practice archery and horsemanship, which all nomadic people were deaf to. Archery was so important during the Qing Dynasty that it was included in the military examination. Archery also has an extensive tradition in China. It was mentioned as far back as the Shang Dynasty, that is uh, the 16th to 11th centuries BCE, uh, in their oracle bone inscriptions, and was highly re revered during the Tang Dynasty, that is 618 to 907 CE. And similarly, archery had a long tradition in Mongolian culture as well. The composite bow, also called the recurve bow, was first used by nomads in the Eurasian steppe around the 9th century BCE and had the physique of half a figure eight. So if you were to draw a figure eight and you were to erase half of it, that's kind of what your typical composite bow would look like. It was an incredibly powerful compact bow that was strenuous to craft. It was constructed from layers of wood, horn, glue, and sinew. The composite bow had an extreme range of 500 meters and a max range of 300 meters with penetrating power and accuracy increasing at closer ranges. However, shooting at such a distance was only used to disrupt the enemy's ranks and the bow was usually shot under 150 meters in actual combat. The composite bow was remarkably superior to the crossbows used in European armies and would remain unmatched in firepower until the invention of the gun. This Manchu composite bow was produced during the 18th century. It is made of wood, sinew, horn, raid skin, cork, black horror, ivory, metal, and paint with a width of 540 centimeters, length of 182 centimeters, and a weight of 0.64 kilograms. The primary distinction between a Mongol and Manchu composite bow uh, was the prominent string bridge and more forward angle of the rigid ear on the Manchu bow. The Mongol composite bow had a reduced maximum stored energy due to its shorter ears, but was faster and shot lighter arrows at a higher velocity. By contrast, the Manchu composite bow shot heavier arrows at a smaller range. Uh, here we have a portrait of Zhang Yinbao, a uh, Qing military officer during the reign of the Qianlong Emperor. He's in full battle dress with a pei dao in his scabbard suspended from a girdle. The sword's hilt is in the rear to prevent it from becoming entangled with the bow that is being carried on the same side. Chinese swords are classified into two categories, jian and dao. The dao has a single edge blade and comes in many shapes. The jian has a straight uh, double edge blade. A pei dao was a type of saber that was wielded in one hand and worn on the left side in a scabbard slung from the waist belt by cords or straps. There are many types of pei dao classified according to the shapes of the blade. The most commonly used type of pei dao during the Qing Dynasty was the liu ye dao, or will leaf saber. Uh, this steel liu ye dao was produced during the 18th century. The, uh, blades, the blade's curve starts ahead of the forte and accelerates at the point. And here we have a steel jian sword uh, produced between the 18th and 19th centuries. However, the Dao sword was most commonly used in combat, and the Jian sword uh, was primarily used for ceremonial purposes, for officers. The saber was adopted by the Chinese military early in the Ming Dynasty through Mongolian influence. In contrast to Chinese sabers, Mongol sabers had heavier and longer blades. Uh, with a minor curvature and were equipped with stubby cross guards and simple hilts such as this iron saber produced between the 13th and 14th centuries. Lightweight blades tended to be associated with higher quality swords. However, weight was not always an accurate gauge for the quality of the weapon. Nomadic people adopted the curved blade because it was more effective for cutting strokes due to its arc, which coincides with the circular motion of the rider's arm when they slash their opponent while on horseback. By the 13th century, uh, Mongolian aristocrats mostly used the saber. It became the primary close combat weapon for the Mongol soldier, although they preferred to shoot arrows at a distance while on horseback, as their close combat skills were usually inferior to the sedentary opponents. The technological edge of the Qing dynasty in gunpowder weaponry 
led to many decisive victories, such as against the Dungar Khanate. At the decisive battle of Diao Mo uh, June 12, uh, 1696, gunpowder weaponry was a crucial part of the Qing victory. The Kangxi Emperor assigned cannons to each banner and addressed his troops. Nothing is fiercer than gunpowder weapons. They are vital weapons for the army. Gunpowder is the key to exterminating Galdan. Before this war, Imperial armies had fought almost all their battles without the use of cannons. However, this time the Kangxi Emperor, um, his army was well equipped with at least 104 lightweight cannons weighing, weighing 100 to 800 jin, and 235 larger cannons weighing 8,000 to 10,000 jin, which is about 5,000 kilograms, including the Taiwan lightweight cannon and Western Xiang bronze cannon. Uh, these smoothbore Western Xiang Bronze cannons were uh, produced in 1689 for the Kangxi Emperor. They used an iron cannonball that weighed three caddies, eight liang, which is about four and a half pounds. And it took uh, one caddy, 12 liang, which is about one and two thirds pounds of powder. Uh, one liang is equal to 0 0.04 kilograms. And the uh, carriages that carried these cannons were similar to English field carriages. This muzzle-loading uh, smooth-bore cannon was named Wu Cheng Dong Gu Da Yang Jun, uh, which translates to Wu Cheng, General Firm Forever, uh, produced in 1689. Chinese people often name their muzzle-loading cannons General because similar to a great general, this kind of cannon carries more power. Breech-loading cannons, muskets, and muzzle-loading cannons were brought to China successively through purchase and capture. Breach loading cannons were first introduced into China around 1506 to 1521 CE, and again in 1523 CE through the coastal provinces of Wujian and Guangdong. The first introduction of muzzle loading cannons occurred in 1620 CE when China bought 30 muzzle loading cannons in Macau, also known as Almen, uh, from Portugal, and invited 23 Portuguese experts along with an interpreter. Uh, this muzzle-loading smoothbore light cannon was produced in 1690 and was used in the Galdan campaigns. It contains Chinese and Manchu inscriptions and was given the name General who exerts power over long distances. It is about one meter long and lightweight, making it easier to be transported on lengthy campaigns. Qing soldiers used a matchlock mechanism such as this one. This matchlock musket was produced around 1750 CE during the reign of the Qianlong Emperor, and has a red lacquer stock. It is made of wood, lacquer, silver, gold, iron, and copper alloy, with a length of 61 and 3 8 inches, which is about 155.9 centimeters. Due to its decoration, uh, this gun was most likely not used in combat, but was used by a noble possibly for ceremonial purposes. The Qianlong and Kangxi emperors own guns and use them mostly for hunting to encourage their soldiers by personal example through martial training. This matchlock gun produced, oh, you have a question? Um, they, would, they would hang them on the walls, you know, as like decoration. You think of like, you know, how you have a piano in your house, you don't really use the piano, right? Uh, kind of like that, you know, that's kind of how it would be used for. Any other questions? Um, this matchlock gun produced during the 18th or 19th centuries was most likely used by a noble due, uh, due to its decoration. However, it is possible that it was also used in combat or for hunting. It is made of wood, copper, steel, iron, gold, silver, and brass with a length of 53 and 1 4 inches, which is about 135.25 centimeters. The musket was one of the primary firearms of the Qing army. Although the Chinese were the first to invent guns, during the Song Dynasty, uh, which, is nine, which is about uh, 960 to 1279 CE, by using the fire lance as a precursor, the Europeans advanced much further in gunpowder weaponry. Some sort of military divergence between China and Europe occurred before 1500 CE. However, European technology soon reached East Asia and China quickly caught up. Although corruption in the government would later disrupt their technological progression once more, putting them behind the Europeans. 
The musket was introduced into China in 1523 CE at a battle in Guangdong province when a Ming army captured muskets for two Portuguese warships. And in 1548 CE after Lu Tong, a Ming commander captured Japanese muskets in battle. The Chinese adopted the Japanese style of musket because they were better than the Western ones that they encountered. The manufacture of muskets was more complex than the breech loading cannons, and the Ming government ordered the, their people to learn the art of musket making. Chinese armies began to use muskets, along with intensive drilling techniques, to deploy them efficiently. The Chinese called their guns Niao Chong, uh, or bird guns, uh, because of their use in bird hunting, and because the gun stock looks similar to that to the beak of a bird. They called their Western weapons Wu Lang Ji, which is a transliterated uh, name for Frankish. They don't have any questions about uh, what we just went over with the military and the weapons. China began to modernize its military to fight the Taiping Rebellion. During the late 1830s, Hong Xiuquan, a uh, young man from Guangdong province in southern China began recruiting followers to help him build a heavenly kingdom of peace, also known as Taiping Tianguo. Uh, he Ping means uh, peace in Chinese. In this kingdom, all Chinese people would share China's vast wealth, and no one would live in poverty. Hong's movement was called the Taiping Rebellion, or Taiping Tianguo Yindong, literally the uh, Taiping Rebellion movement from the Chinese word Taiping, meaning uh, great peace. In the, uh, by the 1850s, Hong had organized a massive peasant army of some one million people. Over time, the Taiping rebellion uh, army took control of large areas of south southeastern China. Then in 1853, Hong, uh, Hong captured the city of Nanjing um, and declared it his capital. Hong soon withdrew from everyday life and left family members and his trusted lieutenants in charge of the government of his kingdom. The leaders of the Taiping government, however, constantly feuded amongst themselves. Also, Qing imperial troops and British and French forces all launched attacks against the Taiping. By, the 18, by 1864, this combination of internal fighting and outside assaults had brought down the Taiping government. But China had a terrible price. At least 20 million and possibly twice that many died in the rebellion. The Taiping rebellion had several other smaller uprisings uh, uh, and other smaller uprisings put tremendous internal pressure on the Chinese government. And despite the Treaty of Nanjing, external pressure from foreign powers was increasing. At the Qing court, stormy debates raged about how best to deal with these measures. Some government leaders called for reforms patterned on Western ways. Others, however, clung to traditional ways and accepted change very reluctantly. Empress Dowager Cixi uh, was also known as Xing Zhen, or the Dragon Lady by Westerners. Zixi ruled uh, imperial China for half a century. She was depicted as a cruel ruler in both China and the West. But her image during her time was that of a compassionate leader. She played a major role in the fate of the civilization. On the 29th of November, 1835, in the Qing Dynasty's imperial capital of Beijing, a girl named Xing Zhen was uh, born, who later became known as the Empress Dowager Cixi. Her father, Hui Zheng, was a minor official of lesser nobility from the Manchu, uh, Manchu Yatanara clan, which belonged to the Ordered Fu Banner, one of the eight banners, a, noble, a nobility and military system of the Qing Dynasty. During this time, Emperor Dao Guang uh, ruled between 1782 to 1850. He was uh, ruling China, imperial China during this time. China was still oblivious to the immense technological gap that had culminated between them and the West. During the Zhongar Qing Wars, 
China and the West were on equal footing as far as military technology is concerned. And this period was known as the Golden Age of the Qing Dynasty. However, now Western imperial powers such as France and Britain set their eyes on China, which would lead to the Opium Wars and the Century of Humiliation. Xing Zhen became the concubine of Emperor Xianfeng on the 26th of June, 18, 1852. Xing Zhen was elevated to Lan Guiren, or Noble Lady Lan. However, this position was a lesser rank in the harem. However, by 1854, she was again elevated to the rank of concubine Yi, giving her more power in the Forbidden City. The emperor's first child of a different concubine was a daughter. During the same time, Xing Zhen became pregnant, and on the 27th of April, 1856, she gave birth to Dai Chun, the emperor's first son. Because of this, she was then elevated to the rank of Consort Yi and gained a significant amount of power in the imperial court. She was elevated again to Noble Consort Yi in 1857. During this time, China was engaged in the Second Opium War with Britain and France. After humiliating the beats, Emperor Xianfeng became depressed and consumed a lot of alcohol and other substances, uh, other substances leading to his death in 1861 at the age of 30. Empress Jun who had grown fond of Xing Zhen, was promoted as Empress Dowager Tsi An. Because, of, uh, because her son was the first emperor of, emperor, uh, of the emperor, Xing Zhen was also promoted as Empress Dowager Tsi Xi. Her son, Zai Chun, was only five years old and could not assume power yet. Tsi Xi began plotting to take control of the collapsing Qing dynasty. Tzu Xi and Tzu An began to form a coup to overthrow the eight regents who were appointed by the deceased emperor Xianfeng. Uh, emperors, uh, after Emperor Xianfeng's funeral procession, the regents were imprisoned, and Tzu Xi became co-regent with her son, with her son, of her son, with uh, Tzu An. Here we have an oil painting by Huber Voss, that was created in 1905 from the uh, Harvard Art Museum. And here we have a uh, portrait of Emperor Xianfeng uh, from the Beijing Palace, uh, the Palace Museum in Beijing. On the 11th of November, 1861, Zai Chun was crowned as Emperor Tong Zhe. Here we have a portrait of Emperor Tong Zhe uh, from the Palace Museum in Beijing. However, the Qing Dynasty's laws forbade women from yielding power in court. So a new political system for the female co-regents was formed. In the imperial audience room, Empress Dowagers Tsi Xi and Tsi An would, would preside from the other side of the screen, placed behind Tong Zhe's throne. This practice was known as ruling from behind the curtain. So this uh, new political system known as ruling from behind the curtain is when uh, Tsi Xi and Tsi An uh, were informally ruling China from behind um, Emperor Xianfeng's, uh, Emperor Tong Zhe's uh, throne. The Empress Dowagers were to be the first to receive all official documents, which were then given to the Grand Council for debate. The Grand Council would then give their reports to the Empress Dowagers, who would then make the decisions. At this time, there were massive rebellions and unrest across China, and the bureaucracy was corrupt. The West saw China as a backward nation, and they did not respect China in negotiation. Thus, China went, underwent the uh, self-strengthening movement. So let's see, uh, purged corrupt officials and promoted talented officials regardless of if they were not of Manchu ethnicity. The Zhongli Yaman, or Board of Ministers for Foreign Affairs, was founded in 1861 under the direction of Yi Xin. Diplomacy with Western nations was immensely improved. 
In 1862, the School of Combined Learning, also known as Tong Wen Wan, was, uh, which taught Western languages, was founded. Plans to modernize China by opening factories were also designed. Cixi also wanted to crush the rebellions that had plagued the nation for 10 years. China began to modernize its army to fight the Taiping Rebellion, which was the main rebellion during this time. And the uh, Taiping Rebellion ended in uh, 1864. However, as the Wongzhi Emperor became older, the Emperor's Dowagers lost power. Uh, Tongzhi fell ill in 1874, and the Emperor's Dowagers used this as an opportunity to regain the regency. Emperor Tongzhi died at 18 years old in 1875 with no brothers or children for succession. Although she was technically co-ruling with Zi'an, it was clear that Zixi had gained the most power. Zixi refused any suggestions to select an adult as the next emperor, arguing that a child should be selected to gain the proper education to rule efficiently. She selected her nephew, Zai Tian, who was uh, three years old at the time. She claimed that he was the adoptive son of Emperor Xianfeng and herself, which went against the succession laws of the Qing dynasty. On the 26th of February, 1875, Zai Tian was enthroned as Emperor Guangxi. Emperor's dowagers Zi Xi and Zi An um, resumed the practice of ruling from behind the curtain. During the end of the 1870s, Zi Xi's health uh, severely deteriorated from temporary liver problems. She was forced to let Zi An uh, take control. In 1881, Zi An died of a brain hemorrhage uh, at 43 years old. Zixi effectively became the sole leader of China at 45 years old, with nine-year-old Emperor Guangxi as her puppet. Although she is credited with the resurrection and modernization of the Qing dynasty, she would also preside over its collapse. Emperor Guangxi was poisoned and died on the 14th of November, 1908, at the age of 37. He was possibly murdered by Zixi. She then designated three-year-old Wu Yi, her grandnephew as the new emperor. However, her plans to rule as regent once again were cut short as she died the following day at the age of 73 of natural causes. Wu Yi was the last emperor of the, Ming, of the uh, Qing dynasty and would later be placed as the puppet emperor of Manchuria, also known as Manchukuo, by the imperialist Japanese empire which we will discuss in a later uh, lesson. The uh, Tongzhi Emperor decreed that the Summer Palace, uh, destroyed by the English and the French in the Second Opium War, would be completely rebuilt under the pretext that it was a gift to Zixi and Zi'an. I uh, visited the Summer Palace in Beijing on my trip there in 2019. Um, so this picture over here is me at the Summer Palace. Over here is just me and Zi'an with uh, the sword that I bought. Um, Japan's victories over China have often been falsely rumored to be the fault of Zixi. Many believe that Zixi, yes? How did you bring that sort of thing? It was, um, so I bought it in China and then they shipped it to me. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, well, it's a ceremonial sword, so it's meant for, um, I'm gonna actually go into detail about what the sword's used for in, a, in the later slide. Um, any other questions? So um, Japan's victories over China have often been falsely rumored to be the fault of Zixi. Uh, many believe that Zixi was the cause of the Navy's defeat by embezzling funds from the Navy in order to build the Summer Palace in Beijing. However, extensive research by Chinese historians um, have revealed that Zixi was not the cause for the, the Chinese Navy's decline. In actuality, China's defeat was caused by Emperor Guangxu's lack of interest in developing and maintaining the military, which I'd like to add is still a very uh, controversial topic and a widely discussed uh, debate. Emperor Dowager Zixi is a uh, very um, controversial historical topic that is still debated by many historians. Um, although I would assume if you uh, talk smack about Zixi in the average uh, classroom that you know no one really, really knows who you're talking about. Right? It's more of a historical um, debate. 
So again, you know, uh, what, what is my sword for? Uh, here it says, uh, uh, which means protect the home, evil be gone. It's meant to, um, it's not meant for cutting, right? It's not even that sharp. It's meant for uh, killing spirits, killing evil spirits. And um, it's meant to protect your home from evil. And um, you're supposed to place it in a certain part of your home. Like it's not supposed to be placed in front of a door for like, you know, uh, you know, because uh, of feng shui, uh, which I'm not going to go get into right now. Um, but it's a replica of a of the Zhou Dynasty. If you're wondering, it's actually a Jian sword, which means that it's a double bladed, right? It's not one side blade, it's got two sided blades, right? It's a Jian sword. And it is a replica of a Zhou Dynasty sword because I'm a, uh, I mainly focus my studies around the Eastern Zhou Dynasty, so I wanted to buy a replica of the sword from that time. And then this is another picture of me at the Summer Palace in Beijing with uh, some nice kids, uh, children who want to take a picture with me. Anyone have any questions thus far about maybe you know what we discussed? Maybe some questions about anything else? Other countries were well aware of China's continuing problems. Throughout the late 19th century, many foreign nations took advantage of the situation and attacked China. Treaty negotiations after each conflict gave these nations increasing control over China's economy. Many of Europe's major powers and Japan gained a strong foothold in China. This foothold, or sphere of influence, was an area in which the foreign nations controlled trade and investment. The United States was a longtime trading partner with China. Americans worried that other nations would soon divide China into formal colonies and shut out American traders. To prevent this occurrence in 1899, the United States declared an open door policy. This proposed that China's doors be open to merchants from all nations. Britain and the other European nations agreed. The policy thus protected the, both the US trading rights in China and China's freedom from colonization but the country was still at the mercy of foreign powers. Humiliated by their loss of power, many Chinese pressed for stronger reforms. These measures called for reorganizing China's educational system, strengthening the economy, modernizing the military, and uh, streamlining the government. However, these efforts brought about no change whatsoever, and the Chinese people's frustration with their situation uh, continued to grow. Uh, this widespread frustration finally erupted into violence. Poor peasant work and workers resented the special privileges granted to foreigners. They also resented Chinese Christians who had adopted a foreign faith. To demonstrate their discontent, they formed a secret organization for the Society of Righteous and Harmonious Fists, or Yi He Tuan Yun Dong. They soon became known as the Boxers. Their campaign against the Dowager Empress's rule and foreign privilege was known as the Boxer Rebellion. In the spring of 1900, the Boxers descended on Beijing, uh, shouting death to the foreign devils. The Boxers surrounded the European section of the city. They kept it under siege for several months. The Dowager Empress expressed support for the Boxers, but did not back her words with military aid. In August, a multinational force of 19,000 troops marched on Beijing and quickly defeated the Boxers. Despite the failure of the Boxer Rebellion, a strong sense of nationalism had emerged in China and the Chinese people realized that their country must resist more foreign intervention. Even more importantly, they felt that the government must be kept, must become responsive to their needs. At this point, even the Qing court realized that China needed to make profound changes to survive. In 1905, the Dowager Empress uh, sent a select group of Chinese officials on a world tour to study operations of different governments. The group traveled to Japan, the US, Britain, France, Germany, Russia, and Italy. On their return in the spring of 1906, the officials recommended that China restructure its government. They based their suggestions on the constitutional market monarchy of Japan. The Empress uh, accepted this recommendation and began making reforms. Although she convened a national assembly within a year, change was slow. In 1908, the, the court announced that it would establish a full constitutional government by 1917. However, turmoil in China did not end with these progressive steps. China experienced unrest for the next four decades as it continued to face internal and external threats. And China's neighbor, Japan, 
also face pressure from the West during this time, but it will be responsive and voice in a much different way. Thank you. Uh, yes, please submit. Please submit your uh, notes on Philippines.